Hello, everyone. Welcome to part five in our series on grounded language understanding. We're going to be talking about the Rational Speech X model, or RSA. This is an exciting model that was developed by Stanford researchers, Mike Frank and Noah Goodman. And it's a chance for us to connect ideas from cognitive and psychology and linguistics with large scale problems in machine learning. Now, what I'm going to do for this screencast is kind of queue up the high level concepts and the core model structure as a way of leading into the next screencast, which is going to show you how to incorporate pieces of this model into standard machine learning models. If you would like a deeper dive on the conceptual origins of this model and how it works in a kind of mathematical way, I would encourage you to check out these resources here. So this first paper, Goodman and Frank from the developers of RSA is a nice overview that shows not only all the technical model details with real rigor, uh, but also connects the ideas with um, decision theory, game theory, cognitive psychology and Bayesian cognitive science and also linguistics. From there, you could watch this technical screencast that I did. This is on YouTube and here are the associated slides for that if you wanna follow along. And from there, I have this Python reference implementation of the core RSA model. And that would be a great way to get hands-on with the model and begin to think about how you could incorporate it into your own project or original system. Without further ado though, let's dive into the model. And I'm gonna begin with what I've called pragmatic listeners. And we can also, as you'll see later, take a speaker perspective. So the model begins with what's called a literal listener. This is a probabilistic agent, and you can see that it conditions on a message, that is, it hears or observes a message, and makes a guess about the state of the world on that basis. And the way it does that is by reasoning essentially entirely about the truth conditions of the language. Here I've got these double brackets indicating that we have a semantic lexicon mapping words and phrases to their truth values. Uh, this agent also takes the prior into account, but that's the only way in which it's pragmatic. Otherwise, it's kind of a fundamentally semantic agent. From there, we build the pragmatic speaker. Uh, speakers in this model observe states of the world, things they want to communicate about, and then they choose messages on that basis. And the core thing to observe here is that the pragmatic speaker reasons not about the semantics of the language, as the literal listener does, but rather about the literal listener who reasons about the semantics of the language. And for this pragmatic speaker here, it does that taking costs of messages into account. And it also has this temperature parameter alpha, which will help us control how aggressively it reasons about this lower agent, the literal listener. Other than that, you can probably see that this model is a kind of softmax decision rule uh, where we're combining the literal listener with message costs. And then finally, we have the pragmatic listener, which has essentially the same form as the literal listener. It observes a message and makes a guess about the state of the world on that basis. And it has the same overall form as the literal listener, except it's reasoning not about the truth conditions, but rather about the pragmatic speaker who is reasoning about the literal listener who is finally reasoning about the semantic grammar. So you can see that there's a kind of recursive back and forth in this model. You might think of this as reasoning about other minds. And it's in that recursion that we get pragmatic language use. Here's a kind of shorthand for the core model components. So the literal listener is reasoning about the lexicon and the prior overstates. The pragmatic speaker reasons about the literal listener taking message costs into account. And finally, the pragmatic listener reasons about the pragmatic speaker taking the state prior into account. And then you can see nicely this point of indirection down to the semantic lexicon. And as I said, it's in that recursion that we get interesting pragmatic language use. Let me show you how that happens with a, with a small example here. So along the rows in this, I have the messages. We're imagining a very simple language in which there are just three messages. You can think of them as shorthand for like, um, the person I'm referring, referring to has a beard, the person I'm referring to has glasses and so forth. And we have just three reference. And I'll tell you that this is David Lewis, one of the originators of signaling systems, which is an important precursor to RSA. This is the philosopher and linguist Paul Grice, who did foundational work in pragmatics. And this is Claude Shannon, who of course is the developer of information theory. And in this table here, we have the semantic grammar, the truth conditions of the language. So you can see that Lewis has this wonderful beard, uh, but neither Grice nor Shannon have beards. Glasses is true of Lewis and Grice, and tie is true of Grice and Shannon. The literal listener, uh, assuming we have flat priors, simply row normalizes those truth conditions. So we go from all these ones to an even distribution. And you can see that already beard is unambiguous for this listener, but glasses and tie present what looks like an insurmountable ambiguity. 
On hearing glasses, the speed, this listener just has to guess about whether the referent was Lewis or Grice, and same thing for Ty. When we move to the pragmatic speaker, we already see that this system starts to become more efficient. So we take the speaker perspective along the rows now, and we, because we're gonna assume zero message costs, we can again, just row normalize in this case from the previous matrix having transposed it. And now you can see that on uh, trying to communicate about Lewis, the speaker should just choose Beard. There's an overwhelming bias for that. And down here on observing Shannon or wanting to talk about Shannon, the speaker should say tie. That's completely unambiguous. But we still have a problem. If we want to refer to Grice, we have kind of no bias about whether we should choose glasses or tie. But already we have a more efficient system than we did for the literal listener. And then finally, when we move to the pragmatic listener, we have a, what you might think of as a completely separating linguistic system. Uh, on hearing beard, infer Lewis. On hearing glasses, your best bet is Grice. And on hearing Thai, your best bet is Shannon. And in this way, you can see that we started with a system that looked hopelessly ambiguous. And now in the back and forth RSA reasoning, we have arrived at a system that is probabilistically completely unambiguous. And that's the sense in which we can do pragmatic language use uh, and end up with more efficient languages as a result of this reasoning. Now, for natural language generation problems, it's often useful to take a speaker perspective, as we've discussed before. And I just want to point out to you that it's straightforward to formulate this model starting from a speaker. We would do that down here at the bottom. This has the same form as the previous speakers. We're going to subtract out message costs, and we have this softmax decision rule overall. But now the speaker, of course, will reason directly about the truth conditions of the language. Then we have our pragmatic listener. There's just one for this perspective. And it looks like just those other listeners accept it reasons not about the truth conditions, but rather about that literal speaker. And then finally, for our pragmatic speaker, which is the one that you might focus on for generation tasks, it has the same form as before, except now we're reasoning about the pragmatic listener who is reasoning about the literal speaker. So we have that same kind of indirection. And once again, here's a kind of shorthand way of thinking about the speaker perspective. So the literal speaker reasons about the lexicon, subtracting out costs. The pragmatic listener reasons about that literal speaker and the state prior. And then finally, the pragmatic speaker reasons about the pragmatic listener, taking message costs into account. And again, you see that recursion down into the lexicon. Now, I've given you a glimpse of why this model might be powerful, but let's close with some limitations that we might address in the context of doing modern NLP and machine learning. So first, we had to hand specify that lexicon. In cognitive psychology and linguistics, this is often fine. We're going to run a controlled experiment, and hand specifying the lexicon is not really an obstacle. But if we would like to work in open domains with large corpora, this is probably a deal breaker. A related problem arises if you look more closely at the way the speaker agents are formulated. In their denominator, they have this implicit summation over all possible messages where we do this computation here. But in the context of a natural language, what does it mean to sum over all messages? That might be an infinite set. Uh, and even if it's finite, because we make some approximations, it's still going to be so large as to make this calculation intractable. So for computational applications, we will have to address this potential shortcoming. It's also RSA, uh, what you might think of as a very high bias model. We have relatively few chances to learn from data. It hardwires in a particular reasoning mechanism as an, and is inflexible about how that mechanism is applied. Uh, relatedly, we might then run up against things like it's difficult to be a speaker and speakers, even the pragmatic ones, are not always perfectly rational in the way the model might portray them to be. And we might wanna capture that if only to do well with actual usage data. And relatedly, even setting aside the pressures on speakers to be rational, they just might have preferences for certain word choices and other things that the model is simply not even trying to capture. And we might hope in the context of a large scale machine learning model that we would have mechanisms for bringing those in. And finally, it's just not scalable. And you can see that in the first two bullet points. And there are many other senses in which RSA, as I've presented it, just won't scale to the kind of big ambitious problems that we're trying to tackle in this class. The next screencast is going to attempt to address all of these limitations by bringing RSA into large-scale machine learning models.